The Clean Energy Show with Brian Stockton and James Whittingham. Hello and welcome to episode 128 of The Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week I dig into why Japan is not making use of their abundant wind resources. Turns out Godzilla is only partially to blame. Tesla will begin shipping their electric semi-truck this year. No word yet if they'll be shipping them via Tesla semi-truck. We look at the details for EVs and a new Biden climate bill. Small, be small detail not talked about. You have to wear aviators while driving any rebated car. Mazda sold only eight electric vehicles in the month of July. It's a headline and a punchline all in one. All that and more on this edition of The Clean Energy Show. So I just wanted to add something to uh, last week. We were chatting about my new electric bicycle, the Ride One Up V2 Roadster Gravel Edition. It uh, it does have a smaller battery, which why I was saying is one of the maybe the downsides of it. Uh, but you can buy an extra external battery from the company and it uh, clicks into the kind of water bottle spot there on the bike. So for 240 oh. US dollars, you can buy an extra little battery. If what you are think the stats gonna... of that battery, Brian? I do not know the stats of the battery, Damn nor it. do I really care. Um, well, is it a I don't 9 volt ever... uh, that the, you took out of your smoke detector for $200 or does it actually do something for you? Yeah, I, you know, it does something. It's, you know, it's a battery the size of a water bottle, a little bit bigger. So, you know. I'm fighting a sneeze. <laughs> Sorry. Give in. Don't fight. <laughs> if there's only bright lights I could stare at. Anyway. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, I, I was talking to you that it was odd because we finally got a, we actually got a press release from Saudi Arabia, from a Saudi Arabi Arabian energy company yeah. uh, boasting about their solar. Because mm -hmm. we, we've been speculating for a long time because we keep charting in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Who's listening to us in Saudi Arabia? And Please. if so, send us a message. No one sent us a message, but send someone message. is listening. Someone. I don't know why. And then we also got a, we went from Saudi Arabia to getting a press release from a local company. Well, they're actually, it's a chain based in Calgary doing uh, car washes. And uh, they're starting a car wash in our town, Mint Car Washes. They do 80 cars an hour. And we, we've we been watching them build this on Victoria Avenue. It looks yeah. like an In-N-Out Burger. We know it's yeah. not an In-N-Out Burger. There's no, no chance of an In-N-Out Burger coming here. Not for, well, two lifetimes at the rate that they expand. So uh, never in a million years did I think that we would end up talking about that car wash, but I guess them sending us a press release, uh, I guess that worked for them. I guess it worked because the reason why I mention it is because they, it's interesting because they have eco-friendly soaps and waxes that break down and they collect their contaminants and sediment and safely dispose of it. And they recycle up to 80% of their water. Now, my oil industry brother-in-law was mad at the only car wash in town that recycles their water in Okotoks. And uh -huh. he said, well, there's salt in it. Obviously, the salt for the road is back in the water. It's just going to rust your car. Um, and no, they don't do that. No. They collect the sediments. It is possible to collect salt out of water to, mm -hmm. um, to actually take it out. And I guess that's what they're doing. Now, I once shot a scene for a film in a car wash. Okay. And... Um the joke of the scene was that um, the car goes in clean and then it comes out dirty. Right. So we just ran everything in reverse and uh, they helped us get the car dirty, the people running the car wash. It was a wand wash place. Right. And all the muck goes down a drain and sort of collects and they, they helped us collect a bunch of this muck and throw oh, it back no. onto the car. It was uh, rather disgusting. But I've often wondered about that with car washes because they use such an insane amount of water. It's obviously not great if it's all just going down the drain. So 80% recycling seems uh, pretty good. Well, some of these car washes now, uh, if they spray it, you know, like a good shower head. Uh, by the way, I want to talk to you about shower heads. <laughs> okay. Why? It's because I just vacationed at your cottage and you're yes. building a new one. Yeah. And I was thinking all the decisions you have to make. It's, it's like being in a film. What color do you want this car in the background? Yeah. What color do mm -hmm. you want this hat on this extra? You know, mm -hmm. being a director means making countless decisions, yeah. actually, <laughs> mm -hmm. until the point where your brain is dead. But you're going to have to make decisions like that on your house because you're building a brand new house. You're going to have to say, Absolutely. I want a faucet. Now, 
you use your water from a tank. It's shipped in and probably replenished after my family's been there. Yeah. <laughs> With our desire for showers and cleanliness and... Uh, and, you yeah, know, there's I, no running water. Everybody has their own cistern. So, but your your tap, when you turn on the tap in your washrooms, it comes out like a fire hydrant, you know, like right. it, there's nothing restraining it. Yep. Um, so I'm thinking, well, first of all, you could probably, if you, you know, if we're still going to live there, you could probably buy some sort of aerator to put on. That would be yeah. the simple thing to do. Just to, I mean, we did change the shower head in the, in the guest house to a low flow one because it wasn't before. Right. But you can go lower than that, I thought. You know? Yep. Um, and, and things like that. The, the, the showers are the most important, and the toilets, of course, if you know, because you want them to be uh, efficient. It's really important. It's not just environmental. It's, it's, it's a matter of conserving water because it's hard to get water. You don't want to run out and keep filling it, right? Yeah, and I, we think that we can use kind of a gray water system where we can maybe use, you know, rainwater or something for the, you know, the sinks and the toilets, you know. And then, you know, I've always wanted, I don't know if it's practical for us, but um, you can get clean drinking water out of the air. They have these things that run like off a yeah. solar panel that just collects moisture from the air and goes through a filter. And, you know, that's a, a possible way to get your drinking water. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you don't drink your water out there because you don't trust your tank, right? Yeah, we drink it separate from the water that runs through the house, yeah. So that might be a way of getting good drinking water. Hell, you know, I filter my drinking water here in the house, yep. and it's still not great. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, it's still not great. We, we've uh, got a good filter under the kitchen sink that it's supposed to take out lead. It's like it's oh. the highest level of kind of home water thing, including lead. Oh, that's interesting. I've got an interesting story coming up on on uh, lead in chickens. Oh, that so, uh, so sounds like a lot of buckle fun. Buckle up for that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good story though uh yeah so i don't know um you know there, and of course lighting and people a lot of people have exterior lighting on their architecture um yep. you want it it's nice to have but mm -hmm. is it necessary is it mm -hmm. causing light pollution in a provincial park when you want to see the stars you're a stargazer mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. um do you want to have are you gonna have a driveway yeah i mean are you gonna yeah. light the driveway yeah, no, those are all great questions. Like we renovated our kitchen five or six years ago, so we have some taste of what that is like. It's like, yeah, you got to make a decision about the light above the sink. You got to make a decision about the pull handles on the cupboards and the finishes for the cabinets and, uh, you know, the flooring, like, you know, what pattern for the flooring and all that. So, yeah, absolutely. Tons of uh, questions to answer. So when I arrived at your cottage, it was a very hot day and I, I kind of roasted my fat self a bit, um, broiled, I guess, or deep cooked, or I don't know how you want to put it, uh, pressure cooked. Mm -hmm. um, but I was a bit uncomfortable. And I was thinking, my God, there's no overhangs in this house. The sun is just beating in. Yeah, But there's no great. overhangs in my house. Either. Yeah, yeah. Um, at all. In fact, there's less overhangs in my house than there is in your cottage. And I seem to manage fine here. I think it's mm -hmm. it's it's better insulated. I mean, that helps. The The right kind of windows help. Like, um, yep. The right reflectivity on modern windows helps keep uh, the sun away in the summertime, uh, lets it through in the winter when it's more lower in the sky and a more of a, a direct angle through the window. Um, so I don't know. Your architect, you know, has come up with a stunning design that is just, I really look forward to seeing it. Like it's just, it's incredibly yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> Are you still doing a round window for the bedroom, by the way? I have to ask. Uh, no, at the moment it's not round, no. How come? Uh, probably just matches better if it's not. I'll see, I'll see. Well, you know, the, it, 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 it's also like floor to ceiling windows in places. So that's going to be like, uh, y y I mean, in the future, as we said last week with our letter, mm -hmm. electricity will be free. It'll be inconsequential yeah. that you could, you know, heat whatever you wanted to heat or, or cool whatever you wanted to cool rather. But right now it it could be hard to keep that place cool um depending on how it is in the yeah summertime. i think we're okay because the the rest of the walls will be very very thick and super insulated so you know you kind of allowed a certain amount of glass area before you kind of screw up that envelope right. so i think it'll be fine and then you have uh assumably in the round earth construction that you're considering or, or going ahead with uh, is that fair to say you're going ahead with round earth considering hopefully uh, okay okay <laughs> 
what's it going to look like if it's not around Earth then? It's going to well, look exactly. like Well, exactly. No, that uh, would be a whole different plan. Yeah. We, we'll yeah. see. Well, it's very interesting, though, because it, the round Earth has, you know, um, sort of stored heat energy. It can take store the cool from the from the night and let it off slowly. It can store the heat from the day and sort of moderate the house. Now, even, regardless of how you're making it, if you chose, say, a concrete floor, that would be one way of um, having, you know, heat storage in the house. Mm -hmm. You might want to go then with a boiler then that goes through the floor. That's what a lot of people do these days. But then, you know, boilers are complicated, as you found out for your rental house, yeah. as far as getting heat pumps for them. Yeah, in-floor heating seems the most likely, but, you know, there's many different ways of heating the, the liquid that's in your in-floor heating, so I don't see that as being a big problem. And then you you got to build a podcast studio out there, you know, yeah. a, a little sound booth with good yeah. airflow. And well, there's good. a little kind of home theater room, so I'm hoping that area will work for a podcast. Sure, as long as it has a good view of the lake, you know. <laughs> yeah. You could then you could shoot yourself as a backdrop then if you wanted Ooh, to. That's a, yeah, I better maybe the whole house should be designed around that principle, Brian. I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, I just wanted to mention that. And another thing I wanted to mention was I was just now looking at the uh, local EV Facebook group as I scrolled through Facebook, and I laughed my ass off at something. So uh, people were uh, somebody bought a brand new EV, and they're asking the question that people often ask. Where do I charge? What credit cards do I need? Do I need an accounts with people from different chargers? And this is Western Canada, by the way. And Cam Roger uh, responded to this person and said that uh, you will likely find the flow card as being the most useful, as well as charge point. To experience the reliability of a Petro Canada charging session, purchase a lottery ticket. <laughs> that is to say... <laughs> Your chances of it working are about the same <laughs> as winning the lottery. I do like a bit of sarcasm, though. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> especially when you're angry at something. that really, <laughs> really makes me feel good to read that. <laughs> and now, some updates to some previously discussed stories. I wanted to mention to our listeners that Connecticut has a new law that EV chargers have to be repaired promptly. Wow. However... I can't find any information on it. I saw it mentioned on Twitter by someone reliable, and I can't find it again. So if you know about Connecticut having a recent law that uh, ensures that EV chargers are repaired within a certain time frame, um, send me an email, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com, because uh, we'll talk about it later. Yeah, I'm sure we have at least one listener, listener in Connecticut. Yeah, and people are knowledgeable. People outside Connecticut are, are knowledgeable too, like they'll, they'll hear about it. Um, and my friend Mike, uh, Mike Nobelock, bought his first EV. He bought an EV, or uh, pardon me, uh, Ionic 5. And I asked him, how is it going? He had it for, I think, about 10 days or so now. Mm -hmm. And he says, it's awesome. It's everything I hoped for and more. It's really fun to drive. Accelerating up to speed so quickly is fun every time you do it. And Mike is not... Not a race car driver, but he's fine. He's finding this fun. He's a reasonable mm -hmm. guy. The ride is really smooth, and the seating is very comfy. It's insanely quiet, and love charging at home instead of going to a gas station, which is something that people don't realize. People worry about where you're going to charge it all the time, but the fact is, you know, you don't take your cell phone to a to a gas station to charge. It's really cool to do it at home. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you didn't do that. So. Uh, okay, an update to the ongoing dispute with uh, Germany and Russia. There is a pipeline uh, supplying um, oil from Russia to Germany, and this is kind of uh, important for Germany. Um, and we've just been keeping tabs on how that's going. Um, there's a second tanker of crude oil coming from America to help kind of fill in uh, the gap. So... Um, 570,000 barrels is due in Germany soon. And this is the second shipment from the U.S. to help uh, bridge the gap. And, and Germany's hoping to reduce their reliance on Russian oil and gas by about 90% um, this year. So uh, let's hope they can manage that. Well, you know, inflation is starting to slow down, at least here in Canada. We had the latest numbers. Yeah, and the and price of gas, of gas has come prices. down. It's because of gas prices. Yeah. So it's amazing how 
if everyone drove an EV, it wouldn't be affecting, inf in, uh, affecting inflation as much, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you'd still have to pay for goods. Goods would go up in price because gas, would, trucking, and so on, and until we get, uh, you know, long-haul trucking sorted out with uh, electrification, which is coming. And yes. um, Biden is, is about to sign the inflation reduction as we speak, right? Yeah, so we've been talking about this for a couple of episodes now. This is a massive, massive bill in the U.S. The, uh, I always forget what it's called. The What's it called? Infl <laughs> the Inflation Reduction Act, or the R yes. IRA. Yeah, and you expect it to be called something like the Carbon Reduction Act. Or the Biden Climate Bill, for is what yeah, some people Biden call it climate bill. But there's a nice article on Bloomberg this week, and it's called The Inflation Reduction Act is a Climate Bill. Just don't call it one. So it's just a nice little article here about the kind of the vagaries of politics and the importance of naming these bills. It's like governments can kind of force the conversation in certain directions yeah. by calling it something. They used to just follow boring naming conventions for these kinds of things. But they realized some years ago that PR is an important part of this. It sort of reminded me of, do you remember when Walmart was kind of coming into Canada, like about 30 years ago? Yeah. Walmart, you know, came into Canada and really started kind of taking over town to town. They were building Walmarts and putting, you know, kind of our local stores out of business. And it was, a, it was obviously a huge change and a huge thing. A lot of people were upset about it. And you know, it's like, ah, oh, this big, massive corporation moving in to take things over. And what did they do? They started these TV commercials. I don't know if you remember this, but it was like they started featuring individuals that worked at Walmart, you know, the Walmart greeters and the Walmart cashiers. And they kind of made it sound like it was a small town store. Like it was like, you know, your people that work at Walmart are just like your neighbors because they are your neighbors. And, you know, it's like... It, it was. They were commercials that focused on exactly the opposite of what Walmart actually is, which is a giant corporation. And it was, you know, kind of uh, annoying and, and sickening. But it's like, well, you know, that's the world of PR. Um, that's kind of how this goes. Um, so the other aspect of that I wanted to kind of mention, which we just touched on briefly, is so yes, it is called the Inflation Reduction Act, but. Um, you know, is that what it's actually going to be or do? And so there was an analysis that suggested that 41% of our current inflation is attributable to fossil fuel prices. So, um, you know, if this can bring down the price of fossil fuels, bring down the demand of fossil fuels, then yeah, it actually should uh, reduce inflation. So uh, as you were talking, I looked up... Um a list of ridiculous U.S. legislation names oh, yeah. that have nothing to do with one. And the Zero Tolerance for Barbaric Cultural Practices Act was one. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I think that was one in Canada, actually. That is one in Canada. Protecting Children from Internet Predators Act, which had little to do with that. The Fair Elections Act was more about Unfair Elections Act. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is actually Canadian stuff which I happen to stumble upon. Usually you get American stuff. Yeah. Uh, serious time for the most serious crime act. <laughs> <laughs> the unborn victims of crime act. Uh, yeah. So that was an abortion related one. And uh, a strengthening Canada's Canadian citizenship act, which of course was anti-immigrant. Yeah. So there's, yeah, but then the States, it gets weirder too. So there's lots of, you know, and and the Democrats are doing it, but the Republicans have done far worse things, I think, uh, over the years of naming acts recently. But like you yeah. said, they used to be boring. And ultimately, they, it's just the name of the bill. It's, you know, whatever's in the bill, obviously, is uh, the important thing. So uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention, which again comes from uh, Bloomberg, our new best friends over there at BNEF. And um, they crunched the numbers in terms of this new climate bill in the U.S., and it's $374 billion, which is a lot of money, but their conclusion, and these numbers are always kind of difficult to calculate because, you know, what's being done by government, what's being done by private. So, you know, it's always a bit fuzzy on the numbers, but their conclusion was that this is a, a really good spend, but the EU and China are spending a bit more than, uh, than the U.S. is with this climate bill. Is that right? Well, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, China back. being the biggest spender right now on 
clean energy transition. Getting back to the naming of this act, though, um, yep. I think there was a column in the New York Times yesterday about how climate has become, you know, part of the culture wars. So yeah. if you're woke, you care about yeah. the climate. Yeah. <laughs> Not only BS. idiots care only, about the climate. Only people who are woke. Yeah. And the rest of it, you know, I, I don't understand. I'm a little bit worried about where the world is going. In fact, I'm a lot worried where the world is going. Uh, also, I think just today people were sharing a Globe and Mail article that is a Canadian national uh, newspaper about the F-150 all-electric lightning pickup trucks, two of them being owned in the prairies here where we live, including one here nearby, Brian and I, and we've mentioned him on the show before. And you know, I assume the Globe listens to our show. I assume everybody does. Oh. I'm sure. High ups in Saudi Arabia, listen. I mean, uh, Biden's probably listening right now. He's right probably. Now. Sure. Uh, so this guy's uh, lightning says he can. Uh, this was interesting to me because I've been interested in facts about my own use scenario because I imagined owning a pickup truck and hauling my um, tent trailer, my, my pop up camper, as mm -hmm. I call them. And he says he has one. He's got um, almost about as big as uh, a pop up trailer as you can have. It's not two axle. There's, they made a few of those, which make no sense to me because that's, you know, what's the point? You might as well have a regular trailer if you got two axles because you have to replace those. Uh, you have to grease the wheels. You have to crease the bearings and, and change the tires constantly. So why have two? Anyway, he says he gets 600 kilometers driving around the city of range, but 330 on the highway with that large pop-up camper. So that gives me valuable information as a person who may want to do that in the future. Yeah, that's a good indication of, yeah, the actual reality of it. Because, yeah, towing reduces the range by a lot, apparently. And, but you know, if I, I just drove our SUV, gas-powered SUV, to the lake with a kayak on top and some bikes mm -hmm. in the back, no camper. Mm -hmm. um, but if I towed my camper, it would have half the range. It would have yeah. half the range as well. Yeah. So that's not bad. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking, oh, you'd have to charge every hour and... Maybe it'd be worth it because you know it costs so much. But um, that's every three hours. That's 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 you don't want to stop then anyway, right? And I stop I stop an hour and a half just to put more oil in my damn engine, <laughs> which you won't have to do in an EV. Yeah, praise the Lord, my God, I hate that. Yes, um, no, I had a Nissan Sentra where we had to to uh, drive it with uh, a bunch of extra. <laughs> Cans of oil, which I put in that movie where we shot at that right. gas station. I was thinking of putting a hose with a funnel on it inside the cabin so I could just add while I drive, you know. <laughs> That'd be great. Oh, yeah. And uh, one other personal update I forgot about. So um, I drove my Tesla up to Saskatoon for to the nearest Tesla service center because I had um, an issue. The suspension started squeaking and the steering wheel was squeaking and... Um, so yeah, they replaced the, uh, I should find the exact name of it here. Just give me a second. Is doohickey in the, the wording at all? Schmengi. Okay, so they told me that the left front upper control arm ball joint had seized. Oh. So they replaced that one and proactively replaced the other one as well, which uh, hadn't, it was still working fine, but I, I think this is probably an issue that they've experienced before. So they went and and replace the uh, upper control arm ball joints, the left and right on the front. And uh, yeah, it took about three hours. It, like it's a two and a half hour drive to get up there to start with. But mm -hmm. I got there first thing in the morning and uh, they gave me a Tesla Model X uh, as a loaner to drive around town while I was there. Ah, I, so, I'm, I may go up there this weekend. Do you think they'll give me one? Yeah, for no, no reason? <laughs> I don't think they will. But, you know, you might want to visit the place. Like, it's it's really the only Tesla service center I've been, I've been there. To. I have done that a year ago, yeah. Yeah, they've got a nice showroom there, and they have, like, you know, images on the walls of, like, their solar options and the, uh, the battery right? options for the home. So I don't know if they're actually doing solar installations there or not. Well, but I didn't think they were in Canada. Yeah, but it is a um, interesting thing. But yeah, so I drove the Tesla Model X for the first time. That was a lot of fun. Of course, this is the one that has the gull wing doors in the back. Have you got so, an order in for it? What's that? Have you got? Is this why you're not oh, doing yeah. the cottage? Is you, yeah, you're running right. one of these instead? Yeah, it'll cost as much as a. Yeah, these things are expensive. 
But yeah, the first thing I did was just drive into a parking lot, park it, and then open the gullwing doors and take a picture. Because, as anyone you know, would, as uh, almost, as I'm would. sure every person who has ever been in that situation would. Driving yeah. the, you just drive somewhere quick. Where can I park? Where can I park? Yeah. So it was a lot of fun, but it, it was a few years old. This was not a new right. vehicle. It, it had a lot of like 95,000 kilometers on it. Mm. And uh, it really looked like somebody's family minivan because it, you know, it was like kind of like a bit of garbage and dirt and everything. Like it is a well-used vehicle. It would yeah. have been more impressive if it was a, if it was a brand new one. But, uh, but yeah, nonetheless, uh, super Did nice, super her? cool. Did you give it a little zip off the line? I did, yeah. It didn't seem all that much faster than my car. I mean, it probably is on paper, mm -hmm. but you can definitely feel that it's a much heavier car because it is. It's like it's the heaviest Tesla you can buy, I think. Right. So, yeah, it certainly still zips around, but you do feel the weight of it for sure. Well, that's cool. Um, I've got a friend who owns one. Uh, he drove me around it, and I was surprised. It, you look at it on the outside, and you say, "Oh, is that a, like a Y?" Yeah, you know, because it's, it's an egg shape. But you get yeah. in, and it's it's like a minivan. It's huge. It's it's yeah, it's not small. So no, it definitely feels a bit like a minivan. Yeah, yeah, and you ride high up, and it's heavy, and all that. But without the sluggish transmission of minivans, which I won't miss. Mm -hmm. And there's even more glass. Like it's the front yeah. windshield just goes right back, so there's no. The weird, like, I, I have to wear a hat in my car, which has a bit of a, a sunroof. This one, like, you definitely can't drive it without a hat because the sun will just beam through. Uh, there is a visor that goes in the middle, but then there's glass above it and glass below it. So, you know, you're still kind of bound to get uh, socked with the sun. I do admire some of the EVs that have come out with those, um, you know, those glass roofs that now have an actual automatic um, thing Dimming. to shade. Yeah, that I makes wasn't a lot thinking of sense. about the electric dimming, but I was thinking about a physical, you know, thing that comes in front of it. So that's nice. Yeah. Uh, okay, on to the next story. This is from Drive Tesla Canada, and this is just our opportunity to mock, mock Mazda or Mazda, depending on where you live in the world. Only sold eight of their electric cars in the U.S. in July of 2022. This is a very sad and pathetic number, but it really is a, I don't know, a compliance car. I, I don't know who would buy this or why. It's only got a hundred mile range, 160 kilometers. Somebody who really likes Mazda. Someone who really likes Mazda. And I could see it maybe if, I don't know, certain business case situations where you're making short little trips or something, but this is not much range than your 2013. Hell, you should buy leaf. one just to, to sell it because it's going to be such a rarity if they stop making yeah, them tomorrow. Be, I mean, yeah, like the actual numbers of these, this is going to be one of the most rare cars you could possibly own. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. They've got a very short range. They, the reminiscent of the early Leafs, right? Like, like Absolutely. A, um, no, this is similar range to your car. Yeah. And why would you do that nowadays? That's my car it's, was made a lifetime ago. Mm hmm. Um, 10 years ago. So yeah, it's just, uh, I, I don't know. I, um, you know, I tried to ask the BNAF guys about Japanese cars and manufacturers. Um, they're obviously lagging behind everyone else and Toyota, you know, they're stuck. They, they're, they've lost me as a customer. I might be, be gone as a customer three times over by the time they get a car out that I can actually buy. Because you mean even once they figure out how to keep the wheels on their damn BZEV or whatever the hell it's called, yeah. B something beyond BZ4X. zero. BZ4X. Uh, by the time they sell them in smaller markets like me that don't have any mandates to sell them, then, uh, you know, it's going to be ages, years, years. And I don't have a lot of time left, Brian. Let's face it. I have to live my life now. And, uh, well, I've got my EV, but I, I would like to, we're still, I, I, I've seen something that there's a stop order on, uh, stop selling, um, Chevy bolts because they have, uh, they're short on minerals for the bolt in the States. Wow. I haven't been able to confirm that before, uh, we recorded the show, but you know, that's, that's not good news for me for getting an EV, but two, three years away by the time they get here too. So. It'll be tough. I don't know what to do. Honestly, I don't. Just, I really don't know what to do. I, I need a bridge vehicle between now and then because uh, we're paying a lot of money for to have our car every month, and I want to unload it while the going's good. So, uh, so I'm going to have some details here about the Inflation Reduction Act for 
EVs, because we didn't get into details about this. Consumer Reports broke it down uh, the other day, so I wanted to talk about what they had to say. So, among other provisions, the new bill will do the following. It offers a tax credit up to $4,000 on used EVs. This is new, but they have to be put into service after December 31st of next year, December 31st, 18 months from now. So the vehicles built and registered 18 months from now will be possible to buy them used with a $4,000 credit. So that's a ways off. Okay. Uh, and, you know, by then there'll be more used EVs on the market. So, I mean, we, this is kind of what... It's good that there'll be more EV. Well, the idea is to get it into everybody's hands of different socioeconomics mm -hmm. and, play, and, and geographic places too, because it's, you know, like we, we suffer here in smaller centers. Um, so it takes away the $200,000 vehicle cap on tax credits that made EVs and plug-in hybrids from Tesla, GM, and Toyota ineligible for tax credits because they've sold more than 200000 of those vehicles in the United States and have used up other tax credits. So people, that's one reason why, you know, GM dropped the Bolt price by $6,700 US or something this summer to make up yeah, for that. Mm -hmm. um, Tesla doesn't care because they have way more demand than, than they can do. But it, it does away with uh, tax credits for pricey EVs, which is something that we see criticized locally here in Canada in the news. Um, why are you giving tax credits to $150,000 cars like the Model X or something? Yeah. Uh, so it does away with uh, today's tax credits for pricey EVs, such as the Hummer EV, the Lucid Air, Model S and X, and Polestar, I would imagine, and Porsche and stuff like that. So I, uh, it eliminates tax credits for vehicles not assembled in North America. This is a critical one here because this is going to eliminate the tax credit for the BMWs the Hyundai Ionic 5, the Kia EV6, the Toyota BZ4X, not assembled here. Maybe one day they will be because, uh, you know, like Nissan with my car, they did two years in Japan and then they yeah. opened up a factory in Tennessee and one in uh, the UK. Maybe they'll, they'll do that and maybe they'll be selling a lot more vehicles. But most important, the bill also immediately restricts the full tax credit on new EVs to vehicles with battery minerals sourced from countries that the U.S. has a free trade agreement with or recycled in North America. So you can buy a car that has recycled batteries if they're recycled in North America, but you can't buy Chinese ones. Uh, so starting in 2024, if any materials, minerals, or components are sourced from foreign entities of concern, you know who you are, China and Russia, the vehicle will not qualify for a tax credit. So that is tricky. And we're going to continue to talk about that, Brian, because uh, nobody seems to know how that's going to wash out. Yeah, because it could be difficult to ramp that up because uh, I think China in particular is kind of the world leader in sourcing these uh, minerals and processing them. Um, and so it does make sense that, you know, we often talk about energy security. I mean, if, if you've got to rely on shipments of oil, from you know places like Russia, you realize suddenly when they go to war, oh man, that was a really bad idea. Um, it's you know all this stuff, you know, impacts the security of your country if you can't uh, source it yourself locally. And Russia, stop going to war, you stupid idiots. Yeah, please stop that. Uh, okay, so the Tesla semi truck is going to ship this year. Um, Elon Musk announced on Twitter, and uh, it's going to have 500 miles of range. And the Tesla Cybertruck with 500 miles of range is going to start shipping next year. So this is a fairly definitive statement. Um, we've been really wondering when electric semi-trucks are going to finally start rolling. Um, there's still not much in terms of uh, semi-truck charging infrastructure. So I'm still expecting to hear more about that. We've only heard of a a handful of places that have the the new Tesla uh, semi charger infrastructure for charging. So you know this will be kind of a slow rollout, I think, because of that, because of the the lack of charging infrastructure. But they can probably, in some cases, charge at the existing Tesla chargers. But um, you know, trucking is a huge part of carbon emissions. So once um, you know semis all go electric, this is a massive uh, step forward in uh, carbon reduction. I'm looking forward to the next Cybertruck event where they update 
the pre-production what's actually going to really happen for real. And we'll know the specs, yeah. the costs. Mm -hmm. The cost might go up. But. Yeah, no, they, they pulled the, the prices down off their website several months ago, um, you know, amidst this massive inflation that's happening. But, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the prices are double what they were originally uh, posted at. Ah, uh, so much for my order. Yeah. <laughs> one day, Brian, one day. My son and I have often discussed uh, Japan. I, I can't remember the details of why, but we have this long discussion. I said, well, one day I'm going to look into why Japan has no wind. He says, why doesn't they, why don't they do wind? Because he say, he, he thinks they don't have any wind because nuclear is so great. Well, they shut down their nuclear. They're bringing it back tepidly, a little bit yeah. at a time. But when they had their Fukushima disaster, they... Uh shut down a bunch of their nuclear. And that has changed public sentiment a lot. It's easy for us to say nuclear is safe, but when you're there and you're experiencing what they did, uh, you're going to probably have a different opinion. So, you know, I, I, I looked up the reason. I finally found an interesting paper and article about this. It's about a year and a half old. Uh, it says that uh, there's limited understanding of the seabed conditions surrounding Japan unlike other locations such as the United Kingdom, because they benefited from oil and gas exploration for decades, right? So in that north coast there off of Europe, lots of oil and gas exploration for decades. So they yeah. understand it now. This is another mm -hmm. benefit to oil and gas is just understanding <laughs> the seabed floor. So they have yeah. limited understanding of what the seabed even is because they don't go down there looking because uh, there's not oil and gas there. Uh, it is the seventh longest shoreline in the world, so there's lots of, you know, wind opportunity there. Another reason they've been slow is conservative government policies, lots of different departments not working together. They actually permitted some wind projects that were three years long, and Cal uh, um, there was no biters. You know, I mean, you, mm -hmm. there, this is a 40-year thing, Brian, yeah. not a 30-year thing, maybe your 20 at the very least. Uh, another problem is their water gets very deep very quickly, down to 200 meters. It's only 50 meters close to the shore, but after a while, it gets down to 200 meters, which is quite, is too deep for offshore yeah. wind. But, but there's new technology around that wasn't there 10 years ago, including floating. So there's a huge opportunity for floating wind potential. Uh, and the wind potential, to my surprise, is not great on Japanese land. Uh, not that great at all. So the best potential is in the ocean. Uh, another setback or drawback is that uh, most of the wind potential is in the north where there's less population. So you have to, unfortunately, um, send that power. I wonder if mm -hmm. they couldn't do it through the ocean. If you, know, if you were in Japan and you had a whole bunch of wind in the north, all these countries are doing undersea DC high power mm -hmm. cables. Maybe because nothing gets disturbed, you just drop it on the seabed. And, you know, you don't have to build towers and bridges and do land studies. You just drop it down there and nobody gets hurt. Not even, not even a fish. So, uh, they, speaking of which, fishing concerns, they're concerned about fish. Yeah, the fish, fishing is um, affected by wind turbines, but they have to do studies on that. So, they're a little behind on that. Um, the uh, nuclear disaster, as you said, um, they temporarily shut down 54 power plants, which is a lot. I don't even know. They sh began shipping in coal and natural gas to, uh, that's no way to go, but that's, you know, that's yeah. not good for the planet. So Fukushima was a turning point for the nation's attitude towards nuclear power. As the associated risks and costs, and costs, became apparent, we're always talking about the cost of nuclear, and even though a limited number of reactors are being restarted, it's unlikely that nuclear power will ever return to such a dominant position in the Japanese energy mix. Uh, so yeah, the the water depth, um, you know, is drops to 200 meters around 20 kilometers to 50 kilometers offshore. So you have a little bit of space to work with. And nevertheless, Japan has a large resource potential. This is a study done of the potential of wind of 61 gigawatts in relatively shallow waters. That's just the shallow water potential. Yeah. That's not floating or anything like that. And remember, a gigawatt is about a nuclear reactor. So and you might say, James, the wind doesn't always blow. Well, on the ocean it does. <laughs> in some places it does, almost around the clock. 
Uh, yeah, and by the way, this is a, a bit of an aside, but the first North American freshwater offshore wind farm will be in Lake Erie. Did you hear about that? Yes, I did hear a little something, yeah. So uh, Leadco asserts that the Great Lakes hold enough energy potential in wind to power the entire stinking United States. The winds wow. of Lake Erie alone could meet over 10% of the electricity needs by 2030 just in Lake Erie. And, you know, Lake Erie is not a big lake. Lake mm. Erie is a small lake. But, yes, Chicago, the Windy City, and all these places, there's wind out there and uh, terrible, <laughs> terrible, terrible polluted waters that you could stick wind turbines in, and they're not so deep that you can't do it. So it that's interesting. I've wondered when that's going to happen. Well, and I, I would wonder about the... I don't know, unsightliness of it. It makes more sense to me if they're off in the ocean. People might be annoyed if the Great Lakes are full of wind turbines, but yep. um, I don't know, hard to say. Now, I, I'd be interested to know what the distance is. Maybe one of our listeners can send in a, an answer to this. What is the distance where wind turbines start to fade? Not Not from the curvature of the earth, but just the atmosphere sort of blurs them out because you look at, you know, you see ships on, offshore yeah. in the ocean. They're kind of faded. They're barely visible yeah. because even on uh, Toronto, off Toronto, you see them like that. Mm -hmm. um, so how far do you have to go before it's an eyesore? I guess is my basic question. Yeah. And farther out would be better as long as it doesn't get too deep, I guess. Uh, okay. There is uh, a story here. I got this from CNET. And uh, the story's a couple of weeks old, but uh, I thought it was worth talking about it because we, we didn't mention it before. But um, Fiat Chrysler has been ordered to pay $300 million in fines over their diesel emissions fraud case. So it's not just Volkswagen that was cheating on emissions. Fiat Chrysler, which is now owned by Stellantis, um, $300 million in fines for lying about the emissions of more than 100,000 Jeep and Ram diesel vehicles. So this was been going on since 2017. They were first accused of doing this and it takes a long time for this kind of stuff to wind its way through the courts, but it has finally come down and they are guilty and uh, it's 300 million is the penalty. So yeah, the U.S. Department of Justice this week announced that uh, FCA has been sentenced in federal court to pay about 300 million in criminal, criminal penalties in addition to serving three years of organizational probation. I what do you suppose that is? Organizational probation? Uh, probation for the organization? I guess. Oh, wait. I think we have a clip. The time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Then as of this moment, they're on double secret probation. Ah, that's what it is. They're on double secret probation. What movie is that from? I was wondering if you would recognize it. You don't? Is it a naked gun related movie? Is it uh, uh no, it's Animal House. Um, oh. And it's extra fun because that's the great Vernon Agopsowich, right. known to the world as John Vernon, yeah. who is from our city of Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. Yeah. But uh yeah, I just always remembered that clip of double secret probation. He passed away a few years ago. Um, yeah, not that long ago. And he, he ended up making a movie here in, late in his career before he died. What movie? Nice. I forget the name, but it had Molly Parker and uh, Callum Keith Rennie was in it. It was shot. I visited the set one day. I actually took pictures of John Vernon on the set of this uh, kind of Western. That's really cool. But Brian, it's yeah. time. It's time. It's time. <laughs> It's time for the Clean Energy Show Lightning Round, a fast look at the rest of the week's headlines in clean energy and climate change. Brian, where has the time gone? China's CATL plans a massive 221 hectare, $7.5 billion battery factory in East Hungary. And um, yeah, because why? It's Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. <laughs> it doesn't matter because there's a new day. There's a new... $7.5 billion dollar battery factory announced. Week. The plant will be capable of outputting 100 gigawatt hours of batteries a year. Uh, that is 100 nuclear reactors powering for an hour uh, per year from this battery factory. And Mercedes-Benz has already gone on record stating that it will be its first customer. Oh, 
You know what that sound is? Time for a Clean Energy Show Fast Fact. Yes. Charging your electric car at home costs the equivalent of 30 cents per liter or less. The more you know. about a twenty a gallon. Yes. Tesla is reportedly going to build Model Ys with BYD blade batteries in their Gigafactory Berlin. What do you think, Brian? Because I'm kind of curious. Yeah, this is interesting. This is a battery form factor that uh, Tesla has never used before. But um, since Tesla's goal is to dominate the Earth, they're really buying and using whatever possible batteries they can get their hands on. So BYD has been making these blade batteries, which are and they're not exactly blade shaped, but they they come in these sort of flat uh, panels and they're all kind of packed together in a battery pack. So yeah, I guess Tesla has um, figured out how to stuff those into their vehicles. So uh, I don't know, it should be good. More supply of batteries, the better. Oh, it's another fast fact. And this is brings us back to backyard hens, which I've been waiting to talk about. <laughs> yes. Backyard hens eggs contain 40 times, this is backyard hen in cities, okay, not yeah. in farms, contained 40 times more lead on average than shop eggs. Then you think you're growing your own eggs and they're healthier? Uh, no, Oof, that doesn't sound good. 40 times the lead, and it depends on the lev lead levels of your soil where you live, which vary across various cities and then vary within the city. In older homes close to city centers, contaminated soils can greatly increase people's exposure to lead through eating eggs from backyard hens. And I was thinking again of chicken, Brian, because they make good pets. Most lead well, gets, hopefully... sorry, most lead gets into the hens as they scratch the dirt and peck food from the ground. Can you imagine the lead levels where I live? I've got a refinery. I've got a, a smelter over yonder. I mean, it's not good. Yeah. Not good at all. That's probably not good. And if anybody of our listeners, if you have hens and you're eating the eggs, maybe they're somewhere nearby uh, where you can get them tested. That's maybe good advice because I think that there probably is somebody listening to our show or, I, or some yes. people and they're going to be uh, soiling their pants right now and not very happy about that because, you know, you, I don't even want to talk about it. It's just that bad. <laughs> it's, 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 it's one of those things that uh, I came across that I thought was important. From Carbon Tracker, the UK government's oil and gas authority has estimated the total bill for North Sea oil decommissioning will be 51 billion uh, pounds. Now, but because of the government's tax policy, the British taxpayer will be responsible for at least 40% of that cost over the coming decades. This is something we're going to be talking about a lot. It is the reality of gas going away. We're going to get stuck with the bill, aren't we? Yeah, and there's been a lot of talk in the UK lately. There's some sweet uh, tax deals for oil and gas companies in the UK. They're getting a bit of a free ride uh, which is unfortunate. California has adopted Bill 2045, or the, no, California has adopted 2045 as an offshore wind target. Plans on installing 25 gigawatts by that time. Uh, that is, again, 25 nuclear reactors worth of almost, I mean, not quite, but, you know, optimistically, yeah. if, they were, if the wind never stopped, um, that's what there would be. And it's not, just as a comparison, it's not insignificant. That is a lot, mm -hmm. a lot no, of power amazing. by 2045. So uh, Xpeng uh, is releasing its S4 supercharger. This is the Chinese EV manufacturer. They've just announced their S4 superchargers on Supercharger Day. That's not Tesla Supercharger Day. That's is a Chinese company. They've opened a 1,000 superchargers in, so far in China. And they say... And they demonstrated this with their new model of car, 210 kilometers or 131 miles of charging in range in five minutes of charging. And they demonstrated that. So 10 to 80% of a full modern large battery in as little as 20 minutes. And this is a 800 volt E class, 800 volt class EV charger with a peak power output of 480 kilowatts which I think is probably around where we're going to stop is around there. You know, I don't think we're going to go, be, I don't think we need to really. Yeah. And you always wonder at one, at, at a certain point, it will 
maybe degrade the batteries if you end up charging too quickly. But, you know, I think those figures are, you know, we probably don't need to go faster than that. And with new battery chemistries allowing for stronger and stronger charging and um, things like that, who knows what's going to happen. But that, Brian, is our time for this week for the summer show. Fire us an email right now, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. We're on Twitter. We're on TikTok. Uh, we're even on Instagram. We're everywhere you want us to be. We have two YouTube channels now, by the way. One for oh, audio and one okay. for everything else that has yeah. video. So go there, find us, uh, watch the show, watch our clips, um, tell your friends. And if you're new to the show, remember, subscribe. Subscribe on your podcast app because we put out new shows every week and they'll be delivered right to you. And we look forward to talking to you next week. See you next week.